we want to use statistical mechanics to understand a little bit about configurational entropy of a system. Now we're not really going to go into statistical mechanics very much, but let me just say that in sort of classical thermo, which is what we have been doing all along, it does not take into consideration very much what is happening at the atomic level. And in contrast, statistical mechanics uh, attempts to take into account what's happening at the atomic level. But we need to consider that if we were really to do that, each atom in the entire system would be described to fully describe the system by its position in space and its velocity as a vector. So that's what we need to know to fully describe our system. If we had that information, we could, you know, give a, give a very exact picture at the atomic level of what our system looks like. Now imagine that we have one centimeter cubed of material, which is really not that much, right? In just that volume, we have sort of on the order of 10 to the 22 atoms, which means that if we want to describe that precisely, our system, that we have to specify 6 times 22, 10 to the 22 values, right? And that's only actually to describe the position and velocity of our system. This says nothing about sort of at the atomic level what the electron energies are. So very quickly it gets out of control to attempt to do this, right? But if we were, if we were to describe the energy of every single atom in the system, we would be describing the microstate of the system. Okay, so specifying the energy of each atom in the system, this is called the microstate of the system because it's naming every single atom, right? This is not easy to do. And so what happens is that atoms that have similar properties or similar, similar energies, we can kind of lump them together and instead work with a distribution function that tells us the number of particles in each energy level. And in doing so, that reduces the information that we need to give about a system. So look sort of at how we might specify a microstate. We will work through an example really in detail in class. But our microstate, right, this is any specific configuration of particles and energy levels. So let's imagine a very simple system where we have two energy levels, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, and we have four particles who I will name A, B, C, and D in this system. One particular microstate that we could define is to have all four particles in the low energy level and basically nothing in the high energy level. A second microstate that we could specify would have particles A, B, and C in the low energy level and particle D in the high energy level. And you could go on and enumerate the rest of the different microstates that are possible here, right? And in this example, there are not that many. You can actually name them all. But if you have you know, 10 to the 22nd particles and 10 to the 15 energy levels, that starts to get sort of out of hand quickly. So we are then, in general, sort of more interested in the state of the system. And as we describe a macro state, the thing to know is that 
we don't really care which particle is where, we only care how many of the particles are where. So this is a more general description. Right, so we only care about how many are there. So one thing that we can say is that each macrostate will have at least one microstate, but typically many more than one. So this has greater than or equal to one microstate in it. So if we think about our example from the previous slide where we had uh, we had no particles in the high energy level and we had four particles in the low energy level. This is sort of the description of one macrostate. And this actually only has one microstate, right, that matches up with it. We looked at a different microstate, which had A, B, and C in the low energy level and D in the high energy level. So here we have one particle in the high energy level and three in the low energy level. This is another macro state, but this is only one of several micro states that matches up to this macro state, right? We could actually have A up here or B or C or D. So there's four different micro states in this macro state. If we want to know how many micro states there are, for a given system, we can do that, and the way that we do so is that we take the number of energy levels that there are, and we raise that to the power of the number of particles. So in our example that we've been doing, we have two energy levels and we have four particles. That tells us there are 16 possible microstates. Usually, though, the number of energy levels in a real system is something like 10 to the 15th, and the number of particles maybe is on the order of 10 to the 22nd, so you have 10 to the 15th raised to this power, and so the number of microstates is truly mind-blowing, right? Now, we might also be determining the number of microstates in a particular macrostate. So the number of microstates in a macrostate, that's what we want to get at. And we saw before in our earlier example that in the this macrostate there was only one microstate, and in this macrostate, there were four microstates. So this variable, we're going to call this thing, the number of microstates in a macrostate, we're going to call this capital Omega. And capital Omega is going to depend on the total number of particles in the system, factorial. So this is the number of particles in the system. Total. And then for the denominator, we have the number of particles that are in our first energy level factorial, the number of particles that are in our second energy level, factorial, on and on until we get to our rth energy level, factorial. So in the earlier example, we had only two energy levels, so we would have only these two terms in the denominator. So that's how we can find how many microstates are in a macrostate. It turns out that out of all of the macrostates that are possible, one of them will have an omega much, much bigger than all of the others. So of all possible macrostates,
much, much greater than all of the others. Now this isn't necessarily true in an example like we've been looking at because the system is small, but in a real, in a real system, this is true. So that state has the maximum omega, and that state then is the one that will be observed most of the time. So the state with maximum omega, just because it has the most configurations, right? If we assume that a system is sampling all of the different states with the same probability, the one that has the most microstates means that it will be sampled the most often. So the state with the maximum omega is what we would observe if we could really sort of detect this at the atomic level. And it is this state that is most often observed that we take to be the equilibrium state. So we take the state with maximum omega, the one with the most microstates, to be the equilibrium state, because that's what we will be seeing at sort of the phenomenological level. Okay, So we can now connect this this idea of, so we know that at equilibrium, right, that from the statistical mechanics perspective, equilibrium is when we have the maximum omega. From the sort of bulk or phenomenological level, we know that equilibrium is with the maximum entropy. So we can then connect those. And this is, was done by Boltzmann, and we use what is called the Boltzmann hypothesis here. And Boltzmann observed that while omega could vary over many orders of magnitude, S doesn't actually vary over many orders of magnitude. And so Boltzmann hypothesized that the configurational entropy is equal to k, the Boltzmann's constant, times ln of omega. Okay, now it's important to note here that this s is only the configurational entropy. So this is the entropy due to either how the atoms can arrange themselves in the energy levels, or sort of how they can arrange themselves in space. It does not take into account things like the um, nuclear energy levels. Okay, so this is the configurational entropy. The more microstates we see, the higher the entropy of the system.